Welcome to the grand finale of the Zizzo Effect podcast, season one. In today's episode, we're taking a nostalgic trip down memory lane, exploring all the fascinating aspects of gamification that we've discussed this season and how gamification is transforming workplaces everywhere. We have looked into the history and origins of gaming, tracing how businesses began to adopt its concepts with simple yet effective strategies. From there, we moved on to the coining of the term gamification and the development of proper incentive plans that keep employees motivated and engaged. We've also highlighted the importance of data integrity and how clean, accurate data is the backbone of any successful gamification strategy. And of course, the origin story of Zizzo itself and how it's revolutionizing the modern workplace. So. Join us as we have fun looking at the greatest hits and misses of this inaugural season of The Zizzo Effect and turn our attention to you, our amazing audience. We'll be answering your burning questions, addressing insightful comments, and most importantly, having fun because that's truly at the heart of what we do. So sit back, relax, and get ready to enjoy an exciting season finale because it's game time. Hello and welcome back to the Zizzo Effect podcast. I'm your host, Andrew J. Reimers. And this morning, I learned the difference between a hippo and a zippo. Do tell. A hippo is a big, gigantic, heavy animal, and a zippo is a little lighter. <laughs> Ultimate dad joke. <laughs> Love it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of dad jokes, so that one uh, I got right away. Credit to my mom for that this morning. Thank you, Marlene. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, my name is Jimmy Shabbat, and... Fun fact about me, I was, I was featured in a national TV commercial for the NFL or with the NFL. So, right. which, which got me some, a little bit of fame in my 15 minutes, I guess. Well, it was more like 15 seconds, but it, well, uh, yeah. is it 15 minutes or is it 15 seconds that it, people are supposed to? 15 minutes. I 15 believe. minutes. Okay. So I'm still owed quite a bit of time. I don't know if we're discounts, but we're not, <laughs> we're not that famous yet. Oh, would you mind telling me a little bit more about what the commercial was for? Yeah, I was part of a mentorship program uh, here with Buffalo Prep that I'm still um, contributing a lot of time with and great program here in Buffalo. Um, but uh, we, I was nominated for mentor of the year in the state of New York, and they featured me in a commercial with the NFL. I did not realize that this was going to be a nationally broadcast commercial when I first agreed to the commercial. But as soon as they started production, I was like, this is a little too big for it to be <laughs> just a small local TV commercial. Then, then it aired on TV, and boy, did I get a bunch of phone call and text messages like, hey, I don't know if you ever seen that meme with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, <laughs> yes. But it was a, a lot We'll of be those. sure to pop it up for our audience yes. for anyone unfamiliar. Uh, <laughs> but that's my fun fact. That is so cool. And uh, no, I know how much you do, uh, you know, definitely in Buffalo as far as mentorship and things like that. And uh, really admirable, really, uh, really cool to see. And I'm glad you got Thank a little you. bit of recognition, even Appreciate if it was that. slightly less than 15 minutes. <laughs> I, I'll take the 15 seconds. Yeah. It was good. Absolutely. Well, thank you again for joining us. Uh, this is episode 12. Can you believe it? The final episode of season one of the Zizzo Effect. Jimmy, I never thought my heart would, <laughs> would make it this long without giving out from all the pressure when you first came to me about doing a podcast together. Yeah. But my God, has it been fun. You've been great. And this whole experience and this journey together has been great. Uh, I think we've learned a lot. We're, we're obviously always looking to improve. I'm excited about season two, take all the lessons that we've learned throughout the season. And, you know, I think for our first season, I think we did great. I'm proud of us. Well, I, I agree. Pat on the back. Pat on the back. Yeah. And uh, of course, we couldn't have done it with our, our fantastic producers, Emma yes. and Alex, who have been here all season. Yes. We're going to save the new producers for season two. We'll yeah. uh, introduce them and maybe give them a proper credit. Uh, that's some of the feedback know. I've gotten is you always talk about Emma and Alex, but you don't give them any real credit at the end of the episode. So are we going to start rolling credits then at the end? Like I quite literally like a movie? Wouldn't be a terrible idea. So Emma and Alex, thank you so much. And speaking of Emma and Alex, if you've been following along since the beginning, you know that we like to start every single episode of the Zizzo Effect, except for episode 11, with a game. Yes. And that game is called Name, Name the, the game. game. This is where our producers will play a song from a famous video game, and it is up to us 
to see who can name the game first. Now, we have our buzzers, and I can tell you, we've been keeping track all year, more or less, of uh, the records. We have the record. And as it currently stands, I'm in the lead with three correct answers. You have two correct answers. Our producers have two correct answers when neither one of us could figure out the game. They stumped us. And we decided to leave Zach out of the records because, let's be honest, we kind of just gave him that one. (laughs) It Uh, made it easy for him, yes. But should we share with our audience what the stipulation is? So we have a name the game right now. Correct. If I win, it's over. It's over. Yeah. If you win, there will be a tiebreaker later on in the episode to see who is the ultimate name the game champion. But why don't you tell them at home what's going to happen to the loser? Well, according to you, we're going to shave our heads, but <laughs> that's not going to happen. <laughs> I have too good of hair, and I don't know if it'll grow back. That's so. what I'm worried about. Yeah. Usually I have it up in the man bun, and that's kind of what's yeah. holding it in. We we did talk about maybe uh, a face scaping, right? Kind yeah. Of, we both wear beards. So. Potentially having a clean shaven face for season two. I would say one episode. Okay. Because I, I can't maintain a shaven face for the whole year. It's just too much maintenance. I know. I'm a low maintenance kind of guy. But enough talk. I know you're just nervous to lose. So let's do I want to get to the game. Emma, let's hear the song. And this one's an old one. It is. It has to be. It's like 8 bit audio. Jeez, this is. Hold on, is a wrong answer a negative point? Well, then I don't have an answer. (laughs) (laughs) Now go ahead, guess. We didn't do that in the past. Gosh, it wasn't a Kirby game, was it? Okay, no, I'm wrong. I'm out. Jimmy, do you have a guess? I'm going to have to have a guess. Let Let me hit my button. It's not Mega Man, is it? I think we already had Mega Man. Did we? Okay, yes. I think we did. All right. Oh, well, you guys won. What was the answer? Wow. Dragon Quest. That is... I should have gotten that one. I'm actually pretty disappointed in myself. Yeah. I played that one somewhat recently when I got the NES package on the Switch. Okay. Wow. Should we just play the game, too, just in case? I mean, we can give myself a tie, at least. Well... Now our producers are tied with me. Oh, there you go. You're so gonna have we'll, to see if yeah. So it's you versus producers. We will have to see, but uh, yeah. we'll save the tie-breaking song. Yeah. I just either way, even if I would have won, I just want to play again later on in the episode. Perfect. But as I like to say, Jimmy, it's time to get down to business. So today we're going to do things a little bit different, Jimmy. Now normally we come in with a topic that we plan to discuss and educate our listeners, but you know what? Our listeners have a lot of great questions that have been coming in all season, and I think it's important that we uh, address those just to help them even further. And I think a lot of people are incorporating gamification into their work, incorporating gamification into their own lives, whether it's through parenting or anything. True. And uh, I would love to jump into some of the fan mail questions that we've had. Sound good? Sounds good to me. Excellent. Let's well, roll. if you don't mind, I'll uh, start us out here. Please do. We have our first question coming in from Mark Calloway from Death Valley. And I found this really interesting. Uh, so I'll ask you, Jimmy, how does gamification cater to different demographics? You know what? It's, it is a great question because we get asked that a lot, you know, when we're talking to either prospects or some of our customers to say, hey, we have a, a an older demographic here and we're not sure if this is right for them. And, and you know, our response is always the same. Like, look, gamification is kind of behavioral science. And through science, we know that human nature is inclusive, meaning nobody's exempt from human nature, from human behavior. And we tap into part of it is curiosity. And I think I've shared this story with you before. Actually, it was your story that you shared. I don't know if we shared it on the podcast here, but where one of our customers, a longest standing customer where their top performer would just refuse to go on the platform and you were on an onsite visit. And during that visit, you're like, Hey, you've earned quite a few Z bucks in your wallet and you can go to the store and redeem those. And she was like, yeah, I don't care about that. And you're like, well, it's, it's kind of a lot. And you know, if you go and just check it out, you know, it's, it's pretty meaningful. Like I think $500 it worth was, of yeah. and you got her to log in. And immediately her eyes went to the leaderboard 
and she's seen herself as number three or four. I forget what position she was in, but she was not number one, although she was a top performer and she led in almost every category. Oh, yeah. In her mind, she was number one. She was number one for sure. And then she was like, what is that? And you're like, oh, that's a lead role. She's like, no, no, no. I understand what that is. Why am I here? And you're like, well, you're not the top performer in that category. And you started taking her through all of the other leaderboards. And, you know, she was in number one and she was so motivated to be number one in every category and she began checking it and i think you could kind of tell us the rest of me because it's i mean it's your story well she began checking it regularly she began she became one of our most engaged agents and realized that wow you know this is a job you know it's collections that she'd been doing her whole life and she was used to it she was used to the grind she was you know used to some of the negativity that comes along with it and all of a sudden the realization was there that not only is my company and my boss investing in me as an employee and letting me know that I do matter and everything I'm doing is important, she jumped to the top of the leaderboard. She continuously has ideas for new games, uh, new ideas for Zizzo, and is constantly cashing out. Uh, one of my favorite things she did was uh, one of the things in our reward store is a Barbie Dream House, which came directly from her that she was nice. able to purchase for one of her children. And not only did she find the fun and then the, a new motivation when she came into work every day, but she's become one of our biggest brand ambassadors telling everyone she knows about Zizzo because it has to put in her terms, it changed her work life. Yeah. Completely. It, it, I mean, it, it could definitely revitalize your thirst for a job that is can be mundane and yeah. repetitive, especially in, in call centers, which is part of our focus, right? Um, that the job itself is usually not that exciting. And so how do you make the job exciting for people is to make it more engaging and to make it more competitive and to give people a sense of purpose and belonging. So to answer the question, great question. It spans all demographics. And if you look at all types of video game, Candy Crush is a game and it caters to usually um, older women. Right. And which uh, I believe that's the I'm, case. Well, I'm not sure that was their intent. <laughs> yeah, right. But they're, I mean, people are addicted to that game they constantly. Are. It's pushed as a free game, but they sell currency and to accelerate, you know, your advancement throughout the game. And so, um, again, Duolingo, which are, and almost all language apps use it to keep people engaged and coming back for more. So, all demographics, nobody's exempt from human nature. And so, gamification works for everybody. I love it. Gamification is for everybody. It is for everybody. Everybody should play games, right? I mean, just because you get older doesn't mean you stop playing. That's right. I, I Reality's broken, guys. If you haven't read this book, Jane McConaughey, we're big fans. We mm -hmm. should tag her. Hopefully, we'd love to have her as a guest Please. on one of the podcasts. I mean, hashtag me uh, on Jane. She talks about it. Gaming is for everybody. <laughs> I've got a question here. Looks like from James Hart uh, from Motor City. And the question is, can gamification be too addictive? And how can that be managed? Can gamification be too addictive? Well, it depends on how you look at it. Now, we've discussed gamification in a lot of different areas and realms of the world. Can roll up the rim to win or, you know, Starbucks games and coffee, you know, can that become too addictive? Maybe if you're hitting it up seven, eight, nine, ten times a day. Is that the gamification or is that the caffeine? Who's Correct. to say? Yep. Um, when it comes to gamification being too addictive, and we're talking about workplace gamification, which I think is primarily, you know, our focus here at Zizzo and on the Zizzo Effect podcast. Uh, I'm not sure that it can be too addictive. However, we do offer special counseling for anyone who feels that way. Uh, I'd be curious to know your thoughts on this. I mean, like you said, I mean, there's different types of gamification. There's gaming, right? Video games. And, you know, I have a son, Chase, yeah. who plays a lot of video games. And do I think he's addicted? I think he enjoys it. And I think he plays it a lot. And yeah, you, it's a subjective term. Well, right? let me ask you this. Have you ever taken yeah. it away from him? I have. How does he react? He scratches his <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I do poke fun at, uh, at him for it. But I mean, I used to play video games when yeah. I was young. You know, when it first came out, you just play a lot. If you enjoy something, you do it a lot more frequently than you would do something that you don't enjoy. So I think for the purposes of, I think the question is more in relation to workforce gamification. And I think if you have a uh, if you have a staff that is engaged with their work and is having fun doing it and is performing and is competitive at it, then it's a good thing. And I think if they're coming into work every day for a long period of time, that's kind of the the behavior that you want. Exactly. I think it's a I don't think it's too addictive. 
is a negative thing. I think it could be a positive thing. Exactly. And people come into work and all of a sudden there isn't a competition happening or something like that. And they might go to their manager and say, hey, you know, what's going yeah. on? I want to play today. I'm ready. I feel like I'm, yeah. I, I'm feeling good. I'm going to have a great productive day and I think I can win. Uh, you know, are they addicted to it or are they just, you know, Engaged. improving their overall performance, you know, you know, through gamification? So, yeah, no, fantastic question. Thank you for uh, for writing it in. Um, let's see. Let's move on to the next one here. So. We have Nyla R. from Hollywood, Florida, who actually uh, got in touch with us. And Jimmy wanted to know, how do you respond to claims that gamification is just a temporary trend without long-term benefits? Hmm. It's a pointed question. So so trend. So if you look at, again, I, I'm going to point back to Realities Broken. She talks extensively about the history of gamification and, and the success of gamification in, in a lot of different realms, right? In retail and education and how it's becoming uh, more mainstream across many different industries. I mean, games, if you look at our back behind you there, Battleship, Yahtzee, Monopoly, Uno, these things have been around for, for ages and they continue to still sell. I don't see it as a passing trend. And that is going to go away. I think from, again, if we're going back to in re relation to work, workforce gamification, and, you know, we talk about modernizing, you know, workforce management. And I think once this trend starts to really take hold and people see the effectiveness and how employees are happier and more productive and there's a culture built around it, I believe it'll be here to stay. Yeah, I think gamification is a res is more of something that became needed Correct. in the workplace. It's not a result of just oh the latest cool trend. When I say when I think of trends in my mind, you know, I think of things like fashion where it's almost cyclical where, you know, you start to see the 80s came back, the 90s come back, you know, eventually you start to see those early 2000s, you know, whatever it might be, low rise jeans again, who knows. Pinning your pants, yeah, do you remember yeah, right? that? Um, you know, that's what I think of as trends. I don't see gamification in the workplace as a trend because I don't see that trend ending and then the outdated ways of managing people and the negative reinforcement that you talked about in the episode with Rich Gold coming back as being a, a part of the workforce uh, workplace again. I think gamification is here because it was necessary. It caters to the up and coming generation that is entering the workforce. And the only time gamification might cease to exist in the workplace is because something new may come around with the next generation. But Correct. like you said, I don't think it's going to be going anywhere. I think once people see the results, they see the lowered attrition, they see the increased motivation, they see the increased performance. Why would you get rid of it? Yeah, it's part of the evolution. Right? Exactly. I mean, if you go back to the history of work, and we talked about this, especially during the Industrial Revolution, people used to work you know, 12 hour days, you know, that's how, why unions were formed. So <laughs> um, this is just that next generation of, you know, the, the workplace has changed, the generation has changed, the needs have changed. So um, this is a solution that I think could be effective for a long period of time. Absolutely. Cool. All right. So next question here, this is from keeping the underscore from Buffalo, New York. So a local mm -hmm. person says, what are the most surprising benefits of gamification? Surprising should be the key. Term surprising. Here. And yes. from our experience and, you know, correct me if I don't quite answer the, the question here, but I'm going to try. Okay. Because I know this is something that's been discussed um, perhaps on the podcast, but maybe more with our customers and some of the feedback and things that we get. Uh, and that's really more about Zizzo as a gamification platform. Now, when I first started with the company and I realized exactly what we were doing here after I'd been hired <laughs> and, you know, I, I saw the gameplay and I saw the different styles and the way we get them short term, long term, you know, intermediate, everything like that, like. I was blown away and could only think, God, I wish I would have had this when I was doing collections, when I was doing inbound sales. But I would say one of the most surprising benefits of gamification, at least in the way that Zizzo does it, is the insights into your personal production and your numbers on a daily basis. So 
gone are the days of having your manager come around and yell at you and tell you you're having a good day or maybe, you know, tell you you had a bad month last month. You know, we've talked about that feedback loop a lot in the past, mm -hmm. but I would say for me personally, the most surprising benefit of gamification has truly been for our agents, our players that use Zizzo to be able to self-manage because you say it all the time, a younger generation that comes in, they want to be communicated with, but they don't want you to talk to them. And our platform provides just that. Uh, what about you? What do you think? I, I think you're absolutely right. And I think you kind of put the disclaimer out there in the beginning when you're answering. It's not necessarily surprising about gamification, but right. more about our platform. And, you know, when we talk to people, especially our prospects, you know, we lead with gamification because that seems to be the buzzword that everybody's interested in and leaning. But it's the it's a novel part of our and it's a very important part of our our platform. Of course. But it is that communication. It's that transparency. It's that real time feedback loop that really keeps people coming back, the users, the agents, you know, the frontline workers who, again, want to be communicated with. What are my expectations? Where am I relative to those expectations? Where am I relative to my peers? How do I stand? Like, what is, am I doing good or am I doing bad? And, and again, instead of getting that feedback at the end of the month or at the end of the year, or maybe right before you get let go or terminated, um, you're getting that in real time. And, you know, the original tagline from the e-whiteboard was what? Micromanagement without the micromanaging. Correct. And and you've seen it and you've heard it from people uh, that you talk with on a daily basis as a director of customer success. People begin to micromanage themselves. They are coming in each and every day and seeing all of this information and then managing their, their day accordingly. If they know they're underperforming, they're going to perform a little bit harder. They're going to work a little bit harder. So, yeah, I agree with you 100%. I think that the transparency and that real-time feedback loop is probably the most underrated component and the most spoken about by our customers. Yeah, and actually thinking about it a little bit more, you know, you just sparked uh, something in my head because it brings me back to a question that we had earlier about how gamification caters to dim different demographics. Correct, yep. And actually, I would say maybe not the most surprising, but a surprising element is we don't have to work that hard to get everybody to participate in this, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're female, male, it doesn't matter. It's for everybody because it's all made and designed around making their lives better as workers, as employees, which in turn increases the bottom line for that company. So maybe not the most surprising, but kind of a surprising thing uh, when you really think about how stubborn some people are when it comes to adopting new strategies. Absolutely. And, and again, modernizing workforce management. So bringing yeah. a new tool to the table. Yeah. And this one is uh, actually almost related to a question we had earlier, but I do think it is still different enough to bring up. So we had uh, LT from S good old San Antonio who wanted to know, doesn't gamification actually distract employees from their main tasks rather than enhancing productivity? And we touched on it a little bit, but maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit more for us. Yeah. And this is a question that gets posed a lot, you know, in our sales processes, like, hey, we don't want this to be a distraction. Right. And my response usually is they're distracted anyways. And usually those distractions are technological in nature. They're on their cell phones. They're thinking about their home lives or contemplating whether they're going to quit or stay. <laughs> uh, and if they're disengaged, and they're distracted by something else regardless, right? So when you're using our platform, yes, it's got a lot of fun elements. We have 3D avatars, there's leaderboards, there's contests, there's that real-time feedback loop and people come to our platform regularly to check to see after they do something, they complete a task or they successfully completed a task. They wanna see that impact. Yep. Did it get me, did it help me move up in the leaderboard? Did it help me get closer to winning the contest? Did I complete my milestone or break a record? And that feedback loop gives them that dopamine rush because not only are they getting the recognition, but they're getting a reward along with it. And that helps repeat that same behavior. So uh, it is what we, we would categorize as a distraction if you're, if you're counting that as not working. But for me, if you're checking your statistics about your work, that is part of your job, yeah. knowing where you are and what needs to what you need to do to, to be successful 
is part of the duties of your job. Absolutely. And, you know, I laugh now because we're at a point when we do talk to prospective clients and things who are interested in partnering with Zizzo and bringing gamification into their culture and their workplace. Every time this question gets asked, and believe me, it is every single time uh, we talk to somebody, I can't even keep a poker face anymore. As soon as I hear it, I just become all smiles because yes. I know what the answer is and I see it. And, you know, I've heard you talk about that. If you're not doing your job well and you're not putting in the time, you're not hitting the phones, you're not closing deals, you're not working to get better, you don't really want to be looking at Zizzo no. because the news you're getting isn't great. And what we see in response to that is people, they aren't too distracted by Zizzo because they realize, oh, shit, I'm at the bottom of the leaderboard. Uh, I can't have my friends or my boss see this. So I'm hitting the phone more. And People, like you said, people are going to be distracted no matter what. I know I'm guilty of it. Everybody is, he yep. said in front of a CEO. But <laughs> uh, to be distracted with something that is actually involving your job and, and your numbers and things like that really is a benefit to the company. There's a, there's a book I reference a lot, especially to anybody that's starting to work with Zizzo. It's called Hooked, written by Nir Ayal. And we should put that up here. It's a must read for, for anybody. It's how to build a habit forming product. And I'll try to keep this simple, but it's a trigger uh, leads to uh, an action, which leads to a reward, which leads to an incentive. So think of it as a kind of four quadrants and it's a constant loop. That trigger usually starts with an external trigger, right? And that external trigger is like a notification. And so think of any of your social media sites. If you get a notification on your phone that says, Jimmy just posted a picture. And oh, so- I wish I got more of those, Jimmy. <laughs> I don't post a lot, of them, <laughs> if, if at all. Uh, but if you clicked on that, that's the action, right? And that action leads to reward and your reward is that photo, right? That picture of whatever it is that I'm doing that I wanted to share. And so then you make an investment and that investment is you're going to comment on it and you're going to like it, right? And that's going to lead to a trigger for me. And I'm going to get that notification and say, hey, Andrew just commented on your photo and my actions to click on that comment, see the comment. That's my reward. And maybe I put an investment and I like your comment and comment back. So that cycle is creating that addictive nature of that application, right? Keeps you coming back for more. It is part of our formula, right? And so for Zizzo is if you're, if the notification is that, hey, you just completed you know, your daily statistics and you click on that or your daily challenges. And then you get a reward uh, for that. And you make that, that investment is I'm going to put more effort into my job so I can get that next level of reward. And ultimately the goal is to replace the external notification, the external trigger to become part of your emotional trigger, which is an internal. So you don't need an external trigger for you to want to go to the site and check on your statistics and check on, you know, your feed and, you know, your news feed and things like that. So it is considered there's a lot of psychology built into um, all applications on how to build habits and that addictive quality. And for us, we're trying to, you know, positive reaffirmation or positive feedback, you know, for people to get recognized and rewarded, which again, if you become addicted to work, is that a bad thing? Depends on who you ask. That's true. Right, right. <laughs> but no, I get your point. I no, fantastic. And uh, I think we answered that question I pretty do, well. Too. Uh, maybe hopefully. even too well. Maybe too well, yes. Yeah. I'm going to go to the next. I'm actually going to go to one of the fun questions here okay. that was asked. And this is more of a personal one here and directed at you. For you. Nate P. from Buffalo, New York. So we're getting a lot of... Uh, uh, local questions here. So, Andrew, you mentioned that you were Buffalo's only Johnny Cash impersonator. Can you tell us how that started? And will you give us an example? I've been uh, asking for this for the oh, whole but all season, so. I know. Wow. Well, uh, I really appreciate it, Nate. Thank you for uh, for paying attention. You know, I never, uh, you know, it was brought up to me when this podcast was first starting about my brand and who I was going to be and we were going to be out there. And honestly, I think it happened a little bit faster and, you know, than I had anticipated. But uh, as long as you're ready for story time with Andrew J. Reimers, here we go. So back uh, in the pre-COVID days, I spent uh, many years working as a musician, a local musician here in Buffalo, uh, in really an original, original music, writing my own music, writing my own songs, putting out records and uh, stuff like that. So about 2016, 
I actually had a theater company reach out to me, Musical Fair Theater. Shout out to them in Amherst, New York. They reached out to me and they were interested in finding somebody because they were putting on a production of Million Dollar Quartet. So if you're not familiar with that show, it's a story about a real life day, December 4th, 1956 in Sun Records with Sam Phillips in uh, Memphis, who actually had Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash all in the studio on the same day, impromptu. And they recorded, they got pretty wasted. They had a blast. There's actually recordings out there. Now the show is a lot more polished than these recordings, trust me. Uh, But the reason they'd reached out was that they had two people who could do the Johnny Cash voice, but one guy wasn't tall enough. And as you may or may not know, Johnny Cash and Elvis were both over six feet tall, which especially in the fifties was something that, you know, pretty amazing. It was well above average, but they already had a six foot Elvis. They didn't have anyone to play a six foot Johnny Cash. And they asked if I had any acting experience, which I didn't. And I agreed though, uh, because what I lacked in acting experience, I sure uh, made up for in confidence (laughs) and ego. Uh, So I did go into, uh, do an audition. It went, Okay, but it was enough where the director said, look, I think we can work with you. Would you be interested in doing this? So without getting into all the dirty details, I will say to anybody who has ever been in musical theater, to anybody that acts, that sings publicly, or whoever goes to to witness musical theater and take it in, like what these people do is incredible. There was such a learning curve for me, but it ended up we sold out 36 out of 36 shows in the course of six weeks like it was a grind and it went so well that a couple of years later we brought it to another theater uh shea 710 theater in buffalo the former studio arena and we did 10 more shows there in a 500 capacity seat theater wow well one thing i learned over the course of two years of theater was a I don't love musical theater, <laughs> <laughs> but you did it. For two I respect years. it. And uh, it, I made money doing it and it was great. But I remember leaving that last show, walking down Main Street in the theater district of Buffalo, actually walking to Mohawk Place to go see uh, some of my friends play. And I had an epiphany and I realized that, wait a second, I don't need somebody else to tell me to be Johnny Cash. I can just be Johnny Cash. So. I created a website. I did a photo shoot. I learned, I mean, not every Johnny Cash song because there's thousands of them, but I learned about four hours worth of Johnny Cash material of some of his most important songs, some of his most popular songs. I shaved my face. I did my hair. I dressed in black and I made it my full-time job. Whether it was bars, restaurants, clubs on the weekends, whether it was birthday parties, whether it was uh, funerals, I played funerals. Uh, or even going in during the day and playing in retirement facilities, nursing homes, uh, places like that, uh, obviously my audience was older, I found a lot of success until the world shut down. Hmm. And I, I did unfortunately lose uh, all of my gigs. I was forced to get a real job with the U.S. Postal Service, which anyone who's been following along at home knows how I feel about that. Uh, But it was something that I'm really proud of because it was something I built myself. Maybe I'll get back into it. Truthfully, the reason I haven't is because I'm so happy in my position here that I don't miss it. But boy, it was pretty cool being Buffalo's only Johnny Cash impersonator for uh, for that short period of time. And as far as an example, um, I'll have to see if I still have the voice. But uh, you just got to kind of get down a little bit like this. It's not quite a southern accent. It's more of just a... a little bit of a lack of enunciation and a hello. What, what I'm about Johnny a line Cash. from a song? What was the, your favorite song to sing? And My can you give us a song, Johnny Cash song to sing? I'd have to say uh, Big River. Well, I taught the weeping willow how to cry. And I showed the clouds how to cover up a clear blue sky. The tears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm losing my breath. That's all you get, because otherwise we'll probably have to pay royalties. We'll have to put that side by side by the real Johnny Cash and see how that pans out. But what an amazing story. And that's awesome. And uh, it sucks. I know COVID destroyed a lot of different careers, businesses and lives, of course. But, uh, you know, uh, it, the dream shouldn't be dead. Yeah, I mean, you can you can resurrect it. I, I might I might someday. Uh, we'll see. But honestly, uh, Nate, thank you so much for asking about that. It's something I'm really, really proud of and I uh, really love to share that story any chance I get. So thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in the spirit of fun questions, Jimmy, 
I have one for you that sure. I'm going to be honest. I'd been thinking all along, and in hindsight, if I was a better podcast host, perhaps I would have asked in the moment. Okay. But we had at GamerBro840, who uh, came to us on X, and I'm assuming the 840 is probably even double 420. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Jimmy, you mentioned your addiction to buying ice cream, not yeah. eating it. Yeah buying ice cream, which is just fascinating in itself. But can you share your favorite and your least favorite flavors of ice cream? The favorite is going to be easy. Um, and let me clarify for anybody who may have missed that episode. <laughs> okay. It's part of our fun facts. And, you know, I'm, I've got a sweet tooth. I'm uh, kind of a junk food addict. Well, I used to be, but not as much. I, I can't lose the weight as fast and I gain it. Yes. I mean, I'm still trying to maintain, you know, my youthful body, but, uh, more of a struggle today than, than anything. <laughs> but so I used to always buy ice cream and I would eat it all the time. So it was, it wasn't just that, uh, I bought it, but you know, as I got older and I wanted to eat less of it, I still bought it. And, you know, when you have kids and you have a large family, somebody else will consume it. So it's not like it's going to waste, but no, my, my favorite ice cream probably, I don't want to say by far, but uh, is death by chocolate. It's a Perry's ice cream. Um, I like, I don't like a plain ice cream. I like like chocolate chips and nuts. And, you know, this has, you know, kind of like brownie bits, uh, chocolate chips and chocolate covered almonds and a chocolate ice cream. So that is the one that I buy the most. Um, used to be Heavenly Hash. Okay. Not a fan of the marshmallow uh, in the Heavenly Hash. Uh, but with respect to the least favorite ice cream, I mean, I guess you would have to have bought it and then hated it to be on that list. Right. Yeah. And I'm trying to think of one that, um, uh, that just disgusted. It. Yeah. Because not only the flavor, but the disappointment maybe, the maybe after the maybe initial it's a excitement. Disappointment. Yeah. I'm trying to think, um, that's a really good question. And, you know, I've bought, like I explore a lot of ice creams. I will say there's one ice cream that I bought that I used to love. It was really in contention for my favorite. Um, I'm trying to think of the brand that makes it Briars and they make them like the different candy bars and they had one for Twix and it was absolutely amazing. And then they just stopped making it. They make all of the other ones. They make Oreo, they make Heath, they make M&Ms, but this Twix one, was just so good. It was a chocolate ice cream with chocolate Twix bars, and and then they stopped making it. So, along those lines, I think the Heath was the biggest disappointment for me because I loved the candy bar. The ice cream just didn't translate. All right. Yeah. So even your least favorite ice cream is still pretty good, though. Right? Still, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would eat it. <laughs> it's yeah, just not I'm what not you gonna, hoped it would be. Yeah, exactly. And, the least, the most disappointing. Well, listen. Once Izzo really takes off and we sell for a trillion dollars, you can develop your own Heath ice cream I, to be exactly what the people. Want. No, I'll, I'll spend that money on re resurrecting Twix. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> it's a great. It was a great ice cream. Fair enough. Fair enough. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you so much for the yeah. honesty and transparency, Jimmy. Of course. Uh, all right, let's move on to yep. the next question, and we'll kind of go back to some of the more serious questions here. We're uh, all serious. Let me see. Here we go. Liz Hute. H -U I don't know how to pronounce it. Hute. I'm just going to say Hute. Maybe the H is on Liz Hute from Sarasota Springs, Florida. Hey, Liz, how do you say your name? Just uh, write us back. <laughs> uh, so anyway, from Sarasota Springs, Florida, how do companies keep their gamification strategies fresh and engaging. How do companies keep their gamification strategies fresh and engaging? Now, this makes me think of companies who have yet to fully embrace the entire concept of gamification and incorporate it into every aspect of their business. So when I think of keeping it fresh and engaging, it brings me back to the days of whoever makes the most phone calls this month is going to win. Well, that doesn't stay fresh because what happens? We've talked about it before. The same people win yep. every single time, right? And becomes demotivating. So how do you keep that fresh? Well, micro rewards, short-term competitions. So maybe it's not who can make the most calls this month is the winner. Maybe it's who can make the most calls in the next four hours because we need a push. Maybe who can close the most deals next week because uh, we have a certain package going out and we're expecting a, a lot of results and we want to capitalize on that. Um not running the same competitions all the time. So 
instead of having one group competition for an entire month, we talked about rank levels and break, you know, not every KPI is created equally, not every human being is created equally, whether it's, you know, they're new, whether they're low performers, whether they're top performers. Uh, so you can create different competitions based on rank levels. So you can do one-on-one -on -one competitions. You can have team versus team, or maybe the company as a whole is having a slow month. And rather than putting people against each other, you take these agents and players and you put them in a competition where collectively they accomplish this goal and they get out early on the last day of the month paid. Uh, it could be something like that. Uh, what about some ideas What do you, that you might have? So what you're basically saying is just buy Zizzo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was trying I to it. say it without it. saying it. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think the most important part of of everything that you just said is making it fair, objective, and all inclusive. Meaning everybody has an opportunity to win and participate and get part of that budget, right? And I think you know that's that's the reason why we developed it the way that we did is because the outdated method and the the, the stuff that gets old pretty quickly is if it is the same people that constantly win, and most companies are gonna you know reward for that you know for the performance of top performers and you're going to alienate the majority of your staff because you're only going to have a handful of top performers. And so you've got to find a way to level the playing field, but keep it fair and objective. So that way your top performers still always have an opportunity, but it's a fair opportunity. And so do the, you know, the new people, the people who have just started, they want an opportunity or that middle performers, you know, your staff is going to, it's going to look like a bell curve. The majority of the people are going to be like average performers and you're going to have a handful of top performers and you're going to have a handful of, you know, low performers. If you give everybody a chance to participate and have an equal opportunity to win and either through diversity of contests or just handicapping it, uh, you're going to get way more engagement throughout your entire workforce and not just m limit it to your top performers. So I agree wholeheartedly. Zizzo, it's fresh. <laughs> <laughs> is that our new tagline? <laughs> no, gamification is for everyone. Zizzo is for everyone. Zizzo is that for should everyone. be our new tagline, yes. but we'll work that out later. All right. So I think we have time for a couple of more questions. Okay. Um, and honestly, Jimmy, I kind of want to go back to a fun one here because sure. we have another one uh, that, that's here for you. Uh, so now this is from DMAC actually coming all the way from Ukraine, just to, uh, as a nice. testament to our international reach here on the Zizzo effect podcast. Um, and this is actually sort of a question for both of us, but I I'll throw it to you first and then I'll answer as well. Sure. Uh, both of you often talk about the fun behind the scenes. Uh, Jimmy, what is the most hilarious or unexpected thing that has happened during a podcast recording? That's an interesting one. And, um, uh... Man, you're gonna have to really push my memory here. I think for me, you know, you're you're very open and honest, you know, about your life. And when you're just open and honest and you share something personal, I think that to me is the best part of this podcast is when you just expose some of that. You're vulnerable and that vulnerability kind of shows through and I and I wanna keep more of that going. Yeah. You know, I think sharing about ourselves personally, that's why we do the fun facts, is we want people to get to know us, you know, on a personal level and you know, so that we they can identify with us and relate with us. We're, we're normal human beings just like everybody else. So uh, I was thinking of it because there's a few things that come to mind now. Uh, one of the best things that I've learned how to do over the course of this season, and this is not a knock on our setup here. Now, we get a lot of compliments on our, our studio. Yep. Um, I think we did an incredible job and you did an incredible job of really encapsulating what Zizzo is about, the mentality we have, the fun that we really want to promote mm -hmm. in the workplace. But sometimes, man, you are on a roll and you are saying you're giving answers and describing things about gamification that are so insightful, that are so amazing. And I'm just sitting here like in awe. And then I have to maintain my in awe face <laughs> because behind you, the sound panels are just falling off the wall. <laughs> And I don't want to cut it in the middle by laughing or being distracted. And that used to happen more. Now I think we got some better tape. Yeah. Um, so there's always that. It really is. It's hard to really, you know, pick out one thing. But this has been I try to have fun in everything that I do in case that's not apparent. Uh, but really, this recording not only has it been a learning experience, but I, I have had a blast. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll try to keep that uh, forward. Maybe we'll start releasing a blooper reel uh, in between seasons. That would be fun. Future. That would be fun. And I think that's part of the culture that we're trying to promote right for our customers is yeah. have fun be honest be open you know be yourself you know it's it's you know life is short and you know if you want work is hard so have fun when you're working so, exactly so i love it 
Exactly. All right. I think we have time for one more question. Would you uh, like yeah. to take this one? Um, yes. Uh, this is coming from Kelsey K from Black Rock, New York. Ah, Kelsey. I know Kelsey K. Uh, and she's she's great. And she, she asked the question, can gamification create unhealthy competition among employees leading to workplace <laughs> conflict? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have, but if you've ever been in a collection space or on a collections floor, I mean, unhealthy is like before gamification and before, you know, things like this were being implemented in a more strategic and, and thought out way. Yep. I mean, unhealthy is a pretty good way to maybe describe uh, the culture in collections for a long I, time. I would. Yeah, I don't want to kind of paint a broad stroke yeah, here against everybody. But I mean, it is traditionally, I mean, there's certain cultures that are traditionally gamified, right? Certain right. industries that are traditionally okay. gamified. Um, and there is a wrong way to do it. And when it is done wrong, it is unhealthy. That's what creates the unhealthy competition yes. is uh, like we alluded to before, running the same competitions all the time. The same people always winning creates unhealthy competition and creates resentment on the floor where, you know, Yes, gamification done wrong mm -hmm. can create the unhealthy competition and workplace conflict. But if you are serious about gamification and all of its benefits and you're using the right platform, whether it's Zizzo or no, I'm just kidding. There's no other there platform. There's no other platform. Um, I think, you know, from our experiences and the feedback that we get and what I see with my own two eyes when I go and visit these customers in person is that the culture legitimately changes. It's not something that we're just preaching and trying to sell a product or anything like that. People genuinely care about each other. People look to help other people. People look to improve their own statistics for the betterment of the company. And I can't think of a single example where somebody came back to us and said, yeah, Zizzo is like really cool in concept, but it's just destroyed our world here yeah. at our company. You know, I, that's nothing that's even anything remotely close, close to that has ever been said. No. And, and the question I think, you know, maybe stems from some of the traditional gamification and, and I'll tell you, and there's a lot of fail saves that we put into Zizzo based on some of that experience, which did lead to unhealthy cultures and workplace conflict. And some, and, and a lot of that has to be, is based on subjectivity and trusting people to do a job or to create contests without bias. And it happens a lot in cultures that are just growing and you've got people who have relationships with one another. A lot of managers sometimes get promoted from being an agent because they were really good at their jobs and they they were just promoted to a manager position, um, but they weren't formally trained yeah. to become a manager. And that's, you know, there's some risk there. And one of those risks is if they're also responsible for distributing your budget for incentives and building contests, a lot of times it's done based on their relationships with people that yep. they've befriended in, in, uh, in the workforce. And so uh, we try to remove all of that biases, right? We try to create comprehensive uh, contests so that way everybody's able to participate. But it, the answer to, to Kelsey's question is yes, it can. And so it's that we as a platform have designed it so that way it doesn't. So yes, absolutely. Gamification could be destructive and harmful to a workforce. Well, I'm grateful that you designed it that way and I'm grateful to be a part of it. I, bef I know we're uh, running out of time for more questions, but we do have one more round of name the game Let's that we it. need to get to that and, I've been. I'm not participating in this, right? You're this not? You? No, well, you have to. Please. Okay, let's do it. All right. Let's thought... just do it. Even okay. though I am the grand champion of name the game season one with an overwhelming score of three out of 12. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did great. <laughs> Solid 250 batting average, but. Just for the fun of it and just for our friends at home who've been following along, thank you so much. We're going to play one more round to name the game, and then we are going to call it a season. Make sure you tune in sometime in August of 2024 for season two of the Zizzo Effect podcast, and who knows what's in store. Yeah, I'm excited. We've got a lot of ideas that we've been talking about, and season two is going to be different. It is. Yeah. So we'll leave you with this. Emma, if you would... Metroid? Is it Metroid? No, I, oh! knew, I knew it. Damn it. That was one of my favorite games. Now, hold on. There were three Metroids. First one. Is it the first one? Oh, good one. <laughs>
Nice. Yeah, how did I pull that one out? I was addicted to that game. I would not stop playing through the wee hours of the night. I remember it came out in, uh, in that summer. We would just stay up all yeah. night and play it. Um, and th- I think that was a time in my life where we would what we would call flip games. That's when games actually ended, <laughs> where you <laughs> yeah. could actually finish a game. Uh, we would stay up until we finished the game. Yep. And, you know, that would be sometimes five, six, seven in the morning. And then we'd have to go out and buy another game. And we'd go collect cans to try to find the money because my parents would not buy me games. They would be like, hey, you can go get a job and buy it yourself. And you know what? You did. I did. <laughs> I definitely did. Well, Jimmy, this has been amazing. Season one of the Zizzo Effect podcast is a wrap. Thank you Thank so you. much for yeah, convincing me to do this. Yes. I really had a wonderful time. I'm really looking forward to where we're going to be going next. As I've said in the past, it's an honor to call you a colleague and a friend, and uh, I will see you down the road. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in this season, and look, we're really looking forward to season two. As we wrap up this final episode of the inaugural season of The Zizzo Effect, we want to extend our heartfelt thanks to all our listeners for joining us on this incredible journey through the world of gamification. From exploring its history and impact to sharing best practices and personal stories, it's been an amazing ride and we couldn't have done it without you. But don't worry, this isn't the end. It's just the beginning. We're thrilled to announce that Season 2 of the Zizzo Effect podcast will be dropping in August of 2024. Stay tuned for more expert insights, exciting interviews, and actionable strategies to make your workplace more engaging and productive. We can't wait to continue this adventure with you. Thank you for being a part of the Zizzo Effect, and until next time, keep playing, keep innovating, and remember, it's always game time.